Good morning, True Grace Church. Whether you're here or you're online this morning, we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for choosing this church. And we are very excited about this message of hope today. So if you will stand to your feet and join us, we are going to praise the glory of our Lord and Savior.
Creation cry 
Lord, you are holy. The angels in the church will one day bow down and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, your holiness, Lord, we simply do not compare. Lord, you are omnipresent. You can be everywhere at once. Lord, you are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. You are omniscient. You know all things. Your thoughts are pure. Your heart is pure. God, I don't feel like we even deserve to live in your area code. And yet, God, you love us and you invite us to walk with you and serve you in our lives. And so, God, today we just stop everything and just say, Lord, I'm not all about myself. God, we don't worship ourselves. We're not the center of our own universe. Lord, it's so easy for us as humans to be so wrapped up in what's going on in our hearts and our lives and our minds and our needs and our pains. And God, today, Lord, I pray, Lord, as this church is gathered together to worship you, that we've all said, God, it's not about me. You're the center of the universe, not me. I'm not living in pride. I'm, I'm walking in humility. And I need the living God to know it's not about me. You created me. I brought no nothing into this world. I'll take nothing out with me. And so, Lord God, we come to you understanding that you are the honored King of kings, the living God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who cares about us and the smallest things going on in our lives. Lord, we want to pray today for our city. God, we pray, Lord, against racism. God, we pray against uh, sex trafficking and human trafficking and abuse of all kinds. God, we pray against drug abuse, God, in our city. God, we pray against violence, God. Lord, we pray, God, that you would answer the problems that government doesn't have the answers for. God, those things, God, that we just look around and say, what are we going to do? What's happening in our world today? God, would you come in and would you heal and would you restore and would you do a mighty move, a, a new work, God, in our own city right here? God, use us in this, in this church to be part of the solution. God, help us to be always on the lookout for someone we can bless, someone we can minister to, someone who needs encouragement, someone who needs help, God. Lord, let our church be a light, God, to this city, this community around us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that the church would be an encouragement to one another, that we would edify and build each other up, especially when we gather together. Lord, today we, we want you to know you are the living God. We recognize that. We don't worship ourselves. And we're asking, God, that you would interact with our lives, that you would use us in this fallen world. And God, that you would shape our character to be more like yours. Help us to live lives that make you proud of us. Thank you, God, for creating us and giving us life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you for worshiping and praying. Hey, let's just decide right now we're going to be people of prayer, amen? And if you look in the mirror and you go, oh, that person's not very good at praying, just, like, tell the devil to shut up, okay, because you actually do pray. You prayed right now. You pray uh, in your life. You don't have to be like this person who prays for five hours a day. Just be a, a man or woman who seeks God, talks to God, and prays. And uh, I'm just praying that we see God do something brand new in our city, perhaps that we've never seen before. Uh, where the darkness is dark, the light shines brighter. Amen? So before you're seated, would you shake hands with four or five people? Find somebody you don't know. Be friendly. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. If this is your first time here, we just want to welcome you. There's going to be a card in that seat back in front of you. If you want to fill that out, you can take it out to the double doors. And uh, there's going to be a friendly person there uh, to help you and answer any questions you might have. Also, if you're joining us online, you can fill that out there. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and our newcomers lunch is going to be today after the second gathering. This is just a great opportunity for us to come together as a church and really meet some of the pastors and some of the faces on staff here and just get to know the heart behind True Grace. Another really cool thing that we have coming up is our outdoor water baptisms. Uh, we got them coming up Sunday, July 30th in Hicks Lake at 6 o'clock at the Gwynwood Retreat Center. Uh, water baptism is just a really good way to be able to express your faith in Jesus uh, publicly and just show the world uh, your faith. So. Yeah, and if you want to be baptized, you can get an application at our info counter or online. And the last day to turn those applications in is going to be Wednesday, July 26th. And just a reminder that we have our kids' water day after our second gathering next week, and that's going to be a barbecue with a lot of fun activities for families, so make sure to stick around for that. Have a great day. <laughs>
Let's go, Brent. Come on, Brent. Come on, show me something. Let's go. I saw that video and I said, you're turning, I went to our interim youth pastor, I said, you're turning our, our True Grace youth into a frat party. What is going on with this, these um, homemade chariots? And nobody got hurt, so I'm glad for that. I love young people and I want to remind our church of this. Everybody who's an adult in this church is consumed and excited about kids and teenagers having faith in Jesus. And we'll lay aside some of our preferences to make sure the next generation gets to follow the Lord um, and has an experience with God. Here's the reality is every young person today needs to have an experience with God, an encounter with God that their parents can't manufacture. Maybe their church has a camp or a mission trip or, you know, a special worship night or something that helps out with that. But every young person needs to experience God in a real way for themselves. Amen. And I look back on those times in my life and that's when God really just kind of synced up my faith. And so um, in our church, we're constantly challenging people. What are you doing for the young people? There were times throughout history where the church actually didn't hand off the faith to the next generation. And it does happen from time to time. And, you know, we can look back through history and see those, those dark seasons and go, wow, like somebody didn't really like tell the stories and share the scripture and, and talk about what the Lord has done in, their, in our lives. And so we just made a decision. That's not going to be true of us. We're going to make sure that the priority is those young people, that they might have a faith, perhaps a faith greater than their parents or their grandparents. You're not going to read that in the news, right? So everything is doom and gloom about, you know, faith in the world today. Um, but we just believe in young people. So thank you for all your support of those young people and what God's doing. Don't let me forget, after this gathering today, there is a newcomer's lunch just down the hall on the left, uh, crossing the elevator. There's a classroom called 205. If you're new the last six months or so, you haven't come to a newcomer's lunch yet, you can come to that. Some of the staff wants to just kind of answer some questions, meet you, greet you. You can get a picture, an autograph with Pastor Dave after the service, put it on put it on eBay. I'm sure it'll go for a lot. And uh, so we just want to say hi. So please do stop by. There's food prepared for you. Uh, even if you didn't sign up for that, we'd love to have you come for that. Also, uh, one thing I really want to make sure I remind you about, in the world today, there's so much going on that we need to just stop and refocus, recenter our lives, repurpose our lives, and make sure that God really is number one in our lives, that we worship him, we spend some time in prayer and reflection and rest. This Friday night, we have an hour and a half of straight worship, and we brought in our friends, the Corbins, who travel America, and they're going to be here Friday night here at True Grace for a special night of worship. And some of you, what's going on in your life right now, like the, the smartest thing you could do is say, I'm setting aside an evening to just come and worship God. Uh, there'll be an incredible presence here, a time of prayer, a time of worship. It's not because it's Sunday morning. Um, you know, it's not like, oh, it's Sunday morning, so I, I go out, get up and I go to a gathering of the church. No, it's a Friday night. And I love those nights. And the only people that came are the people that took the time out of their day to say, I want to be there. I want to honor God. I want to worship God. I want to pray. Um, I'm a little selfish. I also bring my Bible and my journal because I want to see if God wants to tell me something. I write something down because I love being where God's presence is. And so that's this Friday, 7 o'clock. Um, you'll see they look like they like each other. They have five children. And so they're just happy their children are not around right now. Uh, they travel the nation in an RV. So if you got a second alone in your, in your marriage, you probably do that too, all right? So they'll be here Friday. In fact, we're going to steal them for some weekends coming up as well. So that's coming up. We're going to receive the offering today uh, on the screen behind me. There's all the ways to give. I can't remember to say that all that right. But what's important is that we do give. We are created to be givers. Uh, we come into this world with jack squat. That's what we come into this world with, right? And we leave this world with nothing. We get to accumulate some stuff and manage some resources along the way and hopefully leave some stuff behind. 
Um, but I hope that you've decided, you know what, I'm going to leave behind. I'm going to actually take some of those resources, and I'm going to honor God. And the Bible talks about tithing. It talks about offerings that beyond that. Um, you know, the church isn't funded today by the government. There's no government grants that, you know, bought the building and made all that happen. Um, it's the faithful, mature giving of the church. That's how the mission of God is funded uh, at every local church. And so as a, as a pastor to some pastors, I get to go around and visit other churches, and I get to kind of see those churches. And you can kind of tell the churches that are really, like, excited to give, and, you know, they're expanding, and they're doing great things. And I want to say thank you for being someone who puts God first in your finances. I had a young person many years ago, 20 years ago, we did a big challenge to give to missions. And, and in our movement, we had uh, all the teenagers bought all the cars for the missionaries. We're talking about SUVs with like a, you know, big like, you know, uh, what do you call it, a snorkel on these SUVs so they could drive through water in Africa and stuff. And I've been in some of those, those SUVs that our teenagers have, have purchased. And um, I gave a big challenge to our teenagers. I, I really wanted to teach young people how to give, how to be generous. And this one girl came and she cleared out her bank account. And this is 20 years ago. Young girl. She said, Here, here's 200, I think it was $220. And I looked at her and I said, are you sure you want to empty your bank account? Which is not what the pastor is supposed to say if a kid's trying to be generous, right? I was just so, like, amazed. And I talked to her parents. And she said, they said she wanted to do it. And I said, wow, here's another example of a young person teaching me about generosity and sacrifice. And uh, I just want to be one of those people when I get to the end of my life, I can point back and say, you know what, God? A lot of things I messed up at, a lot of ways I fell on my face. But money, not an idol. Just don't want it to be an idol in my life. I don't want something so temporary that's just a tool for good to be something that gets between me and God. And so I want to pray for you today that you would be able to do some great things. I don't know when you, your expiration date's coming, but all the resources that go through your hands, I hope that you do some really cool things for eternity uh, with those resources as well. So let's pray. Lord, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to participate in building the kingdom of God. Notice, really, one thing that matters more than anything in life, and it's knowing the Creator and getting past this preseason on earth to the real life, the real heaven, the real home that you have for us. God, don't let us have wrong priorities along the way. Lord, I pray that you would bless people that they would not be in debt, that they'd take care of their families, they'd have more than enough, God. But Lord, I also pray, God, that for sacrificial, generous giving to be the mark of every believer. Jesus, you are the giver of life. You gave your life, and we're going to give our lives. We're going to sacrifice as well. So one day we get to get home and realize all the ways that you took our giving and changed the world. God bless your church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Lee, and I've been coming to True Grace for a very long time. And I could tell you about the seven years of repeated miscarriages over and over. My story of recurrent pregnancy loss, um, and I could tell you about um, having a baby boy, but still the desire for a girl. And I could tell you of how my dreams were crushed in 2020 when we had a little baby. and handing her over to a mortuary worker, knowing that I was not going to see her again until heaven. But <laughs> I want to tell you a different story. And um, it all started with a trip to Costco, of all places. We went for our groceries, and it was right before Christmas. Happened to go down the toy aisle, and I saw laser t a laser tag gun set. And I'm like, that would be awesome to have for my older kids. I'd love to see them, you know, running around, playing with this. But having a place for my kids to run around, to be able to see them, um, using them is a different story. Um, we had, you know, a house with a tiny yard, but not a place where they could, you know, go out and run around and play. And I didn't think too much of it, but a couple weeks after that, we went and looked at two houses. The first house went for 80,000 over the asking price. The second house, um, they were taking an offer as we were there looking at the house. And um, another, probably six weeks later, my husband calls from work and he says, hey, I found you a house. 
and he gave me the address and the setting is really amazing. A yard plenty big enough for the kids to run around. Um, long story short, we ended up making an offer and in a seller's market where everything's going for over the asking price, we ended up getting the house under the asking price. Um, and so it was a total miracle being able to um, get a house, let alone under the asking price. And then about 10 months after we moved in, um, I'm sitting in the doctor's office, the maternal fetal medicine, the high risk doctor pregnant. And the doctor comes in and she says to me, um, you're waiting for the hat to drop. But before I came in here, God told me that the hat's not going to drop. She said, you have walked this battle long enough. You have faced things that you should have never had to face. It's time for this to end. And she laid her hands on me and began to prophesy over me in the doctor's office. A few months after that, we had the baby and I'm sitting there at our house. The kids are running around, playing laser tag with their friends, running around their yard, and I'm holding a real life baby girl. And I'm realizing how the deepest desires of my heart God had known what they were without me even asking, without me even having the faith enough to tell him what I wanted. God knows where you're at. He knows the things you're facing and he knows the desires of your heart. Wow, isn't that amazing? Amazing story. Thank you, Lee, for sharing that. I, I, uh, and, and I didn't know what was going to be playing before my message today. It's perfect. It's perfect for what we're going to talk about. We got to talk about heaven. We got to talk about heaven. It's exactly what we're going to talk about today. So I'm excited uh, uh, today. If you don't know, my name's Ellis, and uh, I have been going here for almost five years, almost five years now. And we call this place home. I love it. Pastor Peter, thank you. Also, you look strikingly good today. Thank you. Your wardrobe is amazing. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> we didn't plan it at all. So it showed up. Here he is. Well, good. Uh, uh, welcome to Grace. It's good to have you. I'm glad that you're here. Today we get to talk about the joy of following Jesus, and that joy is heaven. 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 Anybody like summer? Yeah, I'm in for summer. I'm always up for summer, and I like me a good road trip. Any road trippers here love your road trip? Yeah, I love a good road trip. About five years ago, my wife and I uh, um, uh, came back from living overseas, and we decided our kids hadn't seen America, so we decided we're going to take them to see America. So I bought the biggest tent trailer my van could pull, and we packed them in, and we drove from this Washington to the other Washington and down to Texas, over to California, and all the way back up. Uh, it's about 7,500 miles in two months. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was a great trip. And about two hours in, the Are, are We There Yet started. <laughs> are We There Yet? Crazy, right? And I heard things like, he's chewing too loud. Um, and you can only imagine, you can only get so far apart in a van, right? The front seat and the back seat. Fortunately, most of our kids have outgrown that. In fact, we just went on a mini road trip a couple weeks ago to Idaho, and my 16-year-old drove some of the way. So it's uh, amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing when they can drive, and you don't have to do those 7,000 miles yourself. The fact is that if you take a road trip, especially with little ones, there's going to be some miserable parts in there, isn't there? You endure those miserable parts because of the destination, of where you're going, what you're doing. There's an excitement there. In fact, it can change the entire perspective of your journey. Another experience that's an awful lot like this is pregnancy. Any, any women out there have uh, a hard or difficult pregnancy? Yeah. We don't do it because it's hard and difficult. We do it because there's a life at the end, and what incredible joy that comes with that, as the, my story shared. It's just amazing joy. We do it for the end goal. It makes all the suffering worth it. And what I want to do this morning 
is I want to remind us of the end goal because the journey can feel miserable, right? We have adult versions of the are we there yet, don't we? We have heartbreaks and health issues and financial pressure and relational stresses and injustice and grief and loneliness and mental illness and even death. The journey holds all of these miseries for all of us. But Hebrews 12 reminds us of this. It says this, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, For the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and the scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus saw the end goal with total clarity and absolute certainty, and it enabled him to endure and even triumph over something that we can't even imagine. For the joy set before him. I was reading recently this fascinating book called The History of the Church, written by a man in the 4th century named Eusebius. He was the bishop of Caesarea in the early 300s, and if you've ever wondered what happens after the book of Acts, read Eusebius. In there, he tells a story of the early followers of Jesus in those first three to 400 years after And I want to retell you one of those stories, a story by a guy by the name of Marinus. Marinus was a Roman soldier, and he was about to be given this prestigious award called the Vine Branch Award, and with it came this promotion to Centurion. But as he was about to receive it, a competitor came before and accused Marinus of being a Christian, which was illegal because Christians would not sacrifice to the emperor. And when asked about this, if this was true, Marinus said, yes, it was. And so the official gives him three hours to decide if he would renounce Christianity. And so Marinus goes to the local church and he asks the bishop there. And the bishop takes the sword in one hand and he takes the scriptures in the other and he asks Marinus, which do you choose? And without hesitation, Marinus chooses the scripture. And the bishop sends him out, says this to him, hold fast to what you have chosen and go in peace. And that's exactly what he does. He holds to the scripture, he refuses to sacrifice, and he's led away to be beheaded. Within just three hours, he was going to be given this prestigious award. And then he gets a promotion of a different kind, not of this world. There's story after story about this in Eusebius' history of the church. People turning their backs on the best this world has to offer, willingly, even joyfully, going to their death. Some are singing as they're thrown to lions. Some are worshiping as they're burned at the stake. One guy by the name of Polycarp, these soldiers come to arrest him, and he literally says, come in, let me feed you, just let me pray for two hours. And so he feeds them this lavish meal while he prays, and the soldiers overhear his prayers as he's praying for everyone and everything he knows for two hours, and then they take him away to be burned at the stake in the arena. Wow! What gives these people this kind of of courage to do something like that? Where does it come from? In a minute, we're going to read a, a passage out of Revelation 21 and 22 where this was written by the Apostle John, who had been exiled uh, to the prison island of Patmos. And he writes to these seven churches in Asia Minor, the region we know of as Turkey right now. Scholars believe this passage was written around AD 96, at the end of the emperor Domitian. He was the first emperor to uh, begin large-scale persecutions of Christians, Christians were crucified, sometimes by the hundreds, and they lined them up on the roads coming in and going out of the city of Rome. And these are the people that Eusebius writes about. So what is the end goal that God gives them through John? What could, so that they could face what they were going to face? What joy did, did John and God uh, set before them? Let's read it. It says this in Revelation 21, 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea and also, was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Amen? And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. Going to skip to chapter 22. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb of God. And it flowed to the center of Main Street. Uh, each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, uh, with a crop uh, each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse on anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no more night, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in this room today, are people that are suffering. It's hard for us to get a picture of what's coming ahead of us. Lord, for those of us who are suffering today through this life and through all this life has for us, I pray today you would give us a glimpse, a glimpse into the joy that we have waiting for us so that we can to endure. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Do you realize... That to a large degree, your present is controlled by what you believe about the future? To a large degree, your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. Let's do a thought experiment together. Imagine that there are two people and they take a new job. And this is the job. To dig a hole every single day and then fill it back up. Dig a hole every day and fill it up. Dig, fill every day for a year. At the end of this, one of these people were told that their salary for doing this would be $20,000. The other was told that their salary will be $20 trillion. Who do you think is going to have a little bit more spring in their step? A little bit more whistle while they work, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Or what about this one? How about this? Imagine two men are being thrown into a dungeon for a year. Few people come out alive. One is told that his wife and children and family have been killed. They'll never see him again. The other is told that his wife and family are waiting for him when he gets out. Who is going to be able to endure? Now, let me say this again. How you experience your present is to a large degree controlled by what you believe about your future. Do you believe that this world is all you've got? And when you die, it's just lights out, you rot away, and someday the sun is going to go out in a blaze of glory, and all of human civilization will disappear, and no one will remember anyone or anything. Or do you believe in a new heaven and a new earth, in a judgment day, that nobody is going to get away with anything and everything you do right now counts forever. Those are two very different futures. And depending on which one you believe, you're going to live very two different lives. What you believe about heaven matters today. It doesn't matter someday. It doesn't matter in the distant future when you're on your deathbed. It matters today. So as Christians, we need to get really clear 
about what kind of end goal we have. Are we talking a 20,000 a year kind of end goal or a 20 trillion? The Bible says that no eye has seen or heart has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And ultimately, all we can possibly understand about heaven is just a shadow of what the reality is. But it is enough to help the Christians in Asia Minor in 96 AD endure some of the worst things you can imagine. And it's enough for you and me too to endure whatever we're going to face today, tomorrow, or the next day. So let's talk about the joy of heaven. And I want to organize it into two main ideas. First is this, it's a reunion, and second, it's a new reality. First, it's a reunion. In this passage we read, there's an interesting reference to God's dwelling with people. A tree of life, fruit from the tree, and the fact that there's a curse. There will be no more curse. Does this sound like anything you've ever heard before in a story somewhere, huh? Sounds like Genesis, right? Right back to the very beginning. You remember that one time when heaven and earth was united and God fully dwelt with man, where humans decided that they wanted to be their own masters, and so they eat from the fruit of the tree they were told not to. And as a result, everything falls apart. A curse descends on us in Genesis chapter 3, and because we've alienated ourselves from God. As a result... Psychologically, we fall apart. Shame comes into the world. We don't know who we are or what we're supposed to be doing. Socially, we fall apart. Gender against gender, class against class, race against race. Physically, we fall apart. The whole world is now subject to death and decay. Death was never in the original plan. That's the curse, and it affects everything. Everywhere we look, every, everything we see, we see a breaking apart. You see it in your life. I see it in mine. Because man has separated ourselves from God and a relationship with God. Heaven and earth have been torn asunder. The reunion of, of heaven and earth is what the entire story, that's the middle part of the Bible. That's what it's all about. That's the mission that Jesus came to accomplish. Heaven is the final complete reunion where God's healing presence comes down to earth and rests on earth again. The passage we read, and it uses imagery of a marriage and a bride and a groom because heaven and earth are designed to be united by God, just like in Eden. In a sense, heaven is a return to Eden. And therefore, it's a reversal of the curse. Read, uh, Revelation 21 says this, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There's no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Forever. Who could use a little bit of forever in that case, right? Right? God's immediate presence brings psychological wholeness, societal wholeness, and physical wholeness. Death, sorrow, and pain have no place because they're displaced by God himself. You know what's interesting? Is that scripture shows us that God made it possible throughout history for the separate realms of heaven and earth to overlap in a very specific place. You know what that place was called? It's called the the temple or the tabernacle. Heaven is God's space and it's perfectly holy. Earth is man's space and it is unholy. And for that reason, they're separate and at odds with each other. But God made it possible for the unholy and holy to partially and temporarily overlap in the temple. How? Through the sacrifice That's what the Old Testament's sacrificial system was all about. When an animal died in the place of a human, the animal's blood would temporarily absorb sin and create a clean space for God's presence could dwell. Heaven and earth could temporarily overlap. And what's amazing is what 
that John 1.14 tells us that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. That word dwelling in the original language literally means tabernacle. So Jesus tabernacled with us. The Bible shows us that Jesus is now the temple. Wherever Jesus went, heaven and earth overlapped and the curse was reversed. To see this, all you have to do is read the stories of Jesus in the New Testament. In there, people are healed and forgiven and made whole when they come into the presence of Jesus. Jesus is also introduced by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So first, Jesus is the temple, and second, he's also the sacrifice. And the cross is the place where Jesus absorbs sin of the world, and he creates a clean space where heaven and earth overlap again. And right now, for those of us who have accepted Jesus' sacrifice, we have a clean space for us. And God's Spirit dwells in us, and we become like little temples walking around. Just put that into your mind right now. You're a little temple walking around a clean space, a little bit of heaven wherever you go. Right now, we do this imperfectly, and we experience it imperfectly too. But someday, Jesus' feet are going to touch down here on earth, and sin's going to be destroyed forever, and the entire world will be clean space. Evil and the suffering that comes from evil will be gone. That is heaven, the holy reunion of God and man, and as a result, life, life, the way we were meant to live. So first... Heaven is a reunion. Second, heaven is a new reality. Have you at some point in your life got the idea that heaven was some kind of spiritual realm, uh, uh, like a a virtual space somehow that you exist and you're just going to spend all eternity just worshiping God? Me too. I had that idea too, right? But that's not what the Bible uh, presents the idea of heaven as. In the Bible... The heaven is a physical place, not one that currently exists, but no less physical or tangible. Let's read. Revelation 21 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. According to the Bible, heaven is actually a restoration of our physical universe. It's going to get resurrected too, one which includes a resurrected earth. And this newly resurrected earth will be familiar to us, but better. It will be a place where culture and society continue to flourish and grow and be productive. We'll be living in a resurrected physical bodies which will dwell inside time and space, but it it will interact with time and space in a different way. Talk about alien. (laughs) That's alien. Because of this reason we know it is because the Bible's first account of Jesus after he rose. It tells us that Jesus is the firstborn of a new race. He is the first and we will follow and be like him someday. And the Bible makes this point to talk about the fact that after the resurrection, Jesus had a physical body. He could be touched. He ate fish. Ghosts don't eat fish. You can't touch them. They make a point to say that. He could somehow travel through matter in a different way. He appeared inside locked rooms. So heaven will be a physical place, and we will have physical bodies similar but different and better. Christian author Randy Alcorn wrote a book called Heaven. And on one hand, our understanding of heaven can only be a shadow of the reality. But on the other hand, the Bible does describe this new earth. And it indicates that this current earth holds some clues about heaven. And he lists off some of these images that hold clues about heaven, and I want to list a few of them for you today. In Hebrews 11.10 and 13.14, heaven is described as a city. In the passage we read, it's a holy city, the new Jerusalem. You and I don't need to scratch our heads about what that's like. We understand cities. Cities have buildings and culture and art and music and goods and services of all kinds. And of course, cities have people. 
engage in all kinds of activities and gatherings and conversations and work. So that's one piece of the puzzle. In Hebrews eleven sixteen, heaven is also described as a country. You and I know about countries. Countries have territories and national interests and citizens both diverse and unified. Jesus talked constantly about a kingdom of God. This is the place uh, under the rule of God, and that's heaven, where God's will is done joyfully. In Revelations 21, heaven is described as a new earth. So we could reasonably expect that there's going to be rivers and mountains and oceans and trees and flowers and an atmosphere. Scripture says there's a river of God that runs right down the middle of Main Street. Revelations 14, 13 says, in heaven will rest. Who could use a little rest? Right? Turn to your neighbor and say to them, you could use a little rest. It's great. I could use some rest. Revelations 22, 3 says, that we will serve Christ on this new earth, working for his glory. There's going to be work in heaven. Our original mandate in the garden was to cultivate creation and make it better. We were told that we were going to rule heaven and earth. Here we are on earth. I have no idea how we're supposed to rule both those realms, two places. We're supposed to partner with God and we're supposed to cultivate and make this world a better place. Join with creation and do that. So far, that mandate hasn't changed. And according to Revelations 22, 5, we're still going to have a job to do in heaven of ruling and reigning. When we put all these pieces together, we understand that heaven is going to be a physical place where we will live out eternity with purpose, beauty, meaning, work, and relationships, and most importantly, an intimate relationship with the creator of it all. We will again walk with him in the cool of the evening, just like in the Garden of Eden. So let me sum all this up, and then I want to talk about some implications. When we understand our future, we experience our present very differently. And as Christians, our end goal is heaven. Heaven is the reunion of God and us. And in that reunion, the curse is reversed. Sin is destroyed and life flourishes. We will experience the fullness of life that we were designed for, psychologically, socially, and physically. There's going to be no more pain or suffering or death and no more sin or evil. Heaven's also a new reality. It's a physical place where we will experience life with physical bodies. It will be a new kind of reality, familiar but better. Now, let's talk about some implications. All of you, I don't know about you, but this doesn't quite look exactly like I've been talking about. You look around today in this world, and pain and suffering and sin and evil is around us on display for us all to see. So what now? For one thing, we begin to understand that the best things are still ahead of us. For you, the best things are still ahead of us. If life isn't working out for you the way you'd hope for, don't despair. Just like the sun burns off a mist in the morning, this world is going to burn away and all of the bad things with it, all of the suffering. Fullness of life is ahead, not just for a lucky few, but everyone who calls on the name and accepts the gift that Jesus is offering. Another way it changes our present is that we're able to endure suffering better. You think to yourself, what? How can we endure suffering better? The reason we can endure suffering better is because there's a joy set before us. There's a joy set before you, and heaven is that. And because of that, The pain of your suffering can lose its sting. Just like a new birth of a new baby, the pain is overcome and overtaken by this new life. Even if death is the very end, we know that death is not the end of our life. A resurrection is coming. Another way this understanding changes our present is that we begin to see our role as mobile temples or tabernacles. 
Because God dwells in you and in us, our lives are places where heaven and earth overlap. And right now, we bring something of heaven to the people and the places around us. The more we go as Christians, the greater that effect becomes on the people and the places around us. People like to be around us because they sense Jesus in us. A love for others, a kindness, a humility, a generosity, a hope, and yes, even a joy in the midst of suffering. And the last implication it has for us is that it grows our love for Jesus. For Jesus. Because the future is only possible because of what Jesus, because of Jesus' sacrifice. It absorbed the unholiness in my life and made a clean space for me to be with God and for you to be with God. Without Jesus, our future is very different. But with him, heaven is our future. Heaven is your future. Now, I want you to do something with me. I want you to close your eyes, and I'm going to read Scripture, and I want you to just use the imagination that God gave you. Just listen to this. And let it spark your imagination. And then the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Did you hear that segment in the middle of that? It is finished. Does that sound anything? Do you you have a story that you can remember from God's book that he says it is finished again? It should sound familiar. It's exactly what Jesus said when he was on the cross. And he's completing his mission for which he came. There's an already and not yet nature to this, isn't there? Jesus has already secured your future. But the fullness of that is not quite here yet, is it? Heaven and earth, to a large degree, are still separate. Sin is still present and active. And we experience it in this world. And we experience it even in our own hearts. We long for Eden, but we find ourselves very much still here on earth. But it's the joy. Heaven is is the joy that is set before you and me. That someday, God's love and grace will invade this earth and it will drive out evil and death and suffering and God's presence will make all things new and we will spend an eternity ruling and reigning with him in a new heaven right here on a new earth. If you're wondering how to get there, it's simple. To Jesus. Jesus is the way. You throw yourself at Jesus' mercy. You ask for his grace. You ask him to forgive you. Doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Jesus doesn't turn anyone away who comes to him and asks. And when you do that, someday there's going to be a reunion for you. With God, yes. But also with everyone who's ever called on the name of the Lord. And that's important to me because I have had people that I love and I have lost. And I'm sure you have too. Behold, I make all things new. Jesus doesn't say, I make all things new. He says, I am making. He's making you new. Would you stand with me together? Heaven starts today. It makes a little difference in your life, but it grows and it grows and it grows and it spreads. And then one day it bursts the banks of the river 
and sin is drowned out forever and this world will all be healed and your body will rise and there's going to be a dinner party like this world has never known. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. When heaven and earth, the bride and groom, are united again. That, my friends, is the joy that's set before you. I pray that that fuels you for your journey in this life. Now, I want to pray for you, and then I want to give you a charge. Before I do, as I look around, and I'm sure as you look around, we don't, we're not living in this. You might be experiencing suffering and pain that this world and evil is running rampant in your life and all around you. For you, I want to pray for you today that you'll be able to endure. And then after I pray, I want to give you a charge. If that's you today, would you raise your hand as I pray? If you just need God's joy in the midst of suffering, just reach out to him as I pray. Heavenly Father, hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you. For the joy set before you, you went to the cross. You saw the end goal. You see each and every one of these faces who are suffering and their hands are raised now and they're saying, Lord, help. God, would you help them? Would you help them? Would you help them? Would you help them? Would the presence of the Almighty God come and invade their suffering in the midst of this world, this dark world, and I pray in the name of Jesus, a light would shine and it would dispel all the darkness, all the suffering. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would be the hope and the light of the world for them and that they would be able to endure. I pray it would take the sting out of this world, out of the suffering of this world, out of the pain of this world, out of the heartache. Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name for my friends. But in the same way, Lord, I pray your joy that it looks forward, that we are reminded that we have to look forward a great day when this will all end and that we'll be remade and made new and you will come down, set foot on this earth, making it all new and we get to experience this new life together. Not only with you, the creator of this world, but all, the, all those who have gone before us. God, I pray for that in Jesus' name. Until then, give us strength to happen, to last until the very end. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, to all of you who are here, I have a challenge for you. Right now, inside of your hearts and your lives, you have a clean space. You have a clean space that God has made for you. What did you do for that? You didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. I got a clean space in here. I didn't do a single thing. In fact, that's the story of God. You can't do nothing. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't go to church enough. You can't pray enough. You can't do all the things that you're supposed to do. Those don't get you in. Just throwing yourself at the feet of Jesus gets you in. You're in. Now you've got a clean space you did nothing for. Now my charge to you is this. Don't hoard it. Don't keep it to yourself. We as followers of Jesus are told and commanded to share this with everyone. And my chance to you is to share it. Share it. I dare you to share it. I dare you so much to share so much of it. I promise that if you give 100 away, you're going to get 200 in return. This is not this kind of world where it's not accounting. This isn't the kind of thing that works in accounting where I just give all the money away and I get more and cap. And that's not how this thing works like money. It doesn't work like that. It works in a scale, on an intern, uh, uh, a spiritual scale. If you give whatever God's given away to you, it will come back to you pressed down, shaken together, all the things that the Bible says. And you're going to have so much you can't keep it. That's my challenge to you because you're going to walk out of these doors and you're going to see people and they're going to be suffering and they have no hope, but you have the hope of the world in there. 
May you give it out to every person you come across with all the passion and power that you can. And when you do, God's going to give it back to you. And he's going to give more and more and more. The more you give, the more you're going to get. And it's going to be sure. I dare you try it. It's worked in my life. Every person I know that's tried it, it works, it works, it works, it works. Go out and do it in this world. And may God go with you as you do. God bless. Have a great day. See you next week.